everyone, and welcome to Metropolitan Stadium. Call it in the air, please. Hands. Hands, he calls. Forty men together can't lose. Okay. Last week in Los Angeles, a new generation of athletes took over on offense. Joe Namath was among the spectators as quarterback Pat Hayden and number 26 rookie runner Wendell Tyler accounted for the Rams' first score against the New Orleans Saints. In nine tries, the Saints had never won a game in the Coliseum, but this Archie Manning touchdown pass to Henry Childs tied the score in the third period and had Los Angeles fans wondering if their talent-laden team would ever find the right combination on offense. Then just one big play made the difference for the Rams as Pat Hayden hit tight end Terry Nelson with a short pass over the middle. Terry Nelson's superb effort set up the touchdown, which allowed the struggling Rams to squeak by the stubborn Saints 14-7. And if you think the Rams have quarterback problems, consider expansion coaches Jack Patera and John McKay, both of whom have tried everyone available at the all-important quarterback position. Last week, McKay's quarterback was former Bear Gary Huff and he led the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to their first two offensive touchdowns of the season, including this bomb to Morris Owens. But the Bucs also turned the ball over six times, and that gave the Seattle Seahawks a chance to find out about their latest quarterback, who seemed to get all his signals straight for the first time last week. In fact, number 16, Steve Meyer, put on quite a remarkable show, especially considering it was only his third start in the NFL. Steve Meyer hit 20 of 30 passes, including four touchdowns, two of them to number 80, Steve Largent. Another Seahawks score resulted when Meyer scrambled left, and a la Fran Tarkenton, found a running back named Sherman Smith, who did the rest. The Seahawks won their first of the season and their third overall while Tampa Bay still awaits that first taste of victory. Meanwhile, in Oakland, the Raiders were hungry for a different kind of history. An 18th consecutive victory would place them in the NFL record book alongside the Chicago Bears and the Miami Dolphins. But this early touchdown by Dave Casper was to be their only score of the day. First, the Raiders' top-ranked rushing offense was shut down by the top-ranked rushing defense of the Denver Broncos. And then all-everything quarterback Ken Stabler was harried into his worst day ever, including three sacks and seven interceptions. Denver quarterback Craig Morton took advantage of Oakland's turnovers in a variety of ways. In fact, the Broncos scored four touchdowns, and each was accomplished in a different manner. First number 88, tight end Riley Odoms tied the score with an end zone reception, which was soon followed by a beautifully blocked end sweep for a touchdown by running back Lonnie Perrin, number 35. Another touchdown came by way of an interception return. But the most ingenious scoring play of the day belonged to place kicker Jim Turner and his holder Norris Weiss, number 14. Jim Turner explained the first touchdown of his 14-year career by saying, I ran out of fear. Obviously, speed wasn't involved. Whatever the reasons, the Raiders' victory string had been snapped at 17 while the Broncos continued their own longest winning streak, which now stands at seven. And would you believe these same two teams meet again next week in Denver? Just try and get a ticket for that one. 
No one could really blame the Buffalo Bills for wanting to beat their heads on something. After all, before last Sunday, Buffalo had yet to win a single game for head coach Jim Ringo, having dropped 14 straight. Against the red-hot Atlanta Falcons, however, the tide turned, and the man who turned it was the juice. O.J. Simpson slid through Atlanta for 138 yards to surpass the 10,000-yard career rushing mark and was something Atlanta's new head coach, Lehman Bennett, would just as soon not have seen. For while his Falcons held the Bills to a mere three points, in the end, it was enough to let the Bills enjoy a three-to-nothing victory. The worst catastrophe since the Buffalo snow of this past winter was finally over. With last season's storms behind them, Miami Dolphin fans are enjoying 1977 more and more, while opponents like the New York Jets are enjoying playing the Dolphins much less. Against New York last week, Miami's defense was tough when it had to be, while their offense, led by quarterback Bob Greasy, was precise when it had to be. Twice greasy scoring passes found their mark, and these proved the difference as Miami held off a stubborn and improved Jet team 21 to 17. In San Diego, the Chargers are a team that lives by the big play, and it was this all or nothing style they hoped would speed them past the New England Patriots last week. Their plan, however, like this Don Woods effort, came up short. Throughout the afternoon, both San Diego and New England found long-range strikes to be so close, yet so far away. In a big play shortage, New England became the favorite since it also possessed a bruising ball control offense. Three short touchdowns, the longest being this Ike Forte seven-yarder, enabled the Patriots to slip past the Chargers 24 to 20, keeping their hopes for catching the high-flying Baltimore Colts alive. Baltimore took their glimmering, unbeaten mark to Kansas City last Sunday in a tune-up game for this week's AFC Eastern Division showdown with the Patriots. Their leader is number seven, quarterback Burt Jones, last year's NFL Player of the Year. Number seven is a blueprint of the perfect quarterback, owning all the physical as well as mental attributes needed for greatness. But what helps Jones shine is a polished offensive supporting cast, diverse in its methods of fire. Using the big play as the exception rather than the rule, Jones kept close to the vest, using runners Ron Lee, Don McCauley, and Lydell Mitchell to pick the Chiefs apart and move virtually at will. Yet for all their movement down near the goal line, Baltimore found further progress difficult indeed. Baltimore failed to score here and would manage only two other short touchdowns on the afternoon. It was a bewildering experience for this team, which is used to racking up many points each afternoon. Yet today, Jones and company were safe, for 17 points would be plenty as Kansas City was stonewalled by the sack pack, an improved version of the Colts' defense, which has helped Baltimore into the playoffs during consecutive years. Old strong men like John Dutton, number 78, made life miserable for chief runners and quarterbacks alike. 
turning Kansas City's offense into a state of confusion. The men in red were held to a single touchdown despite several other opportunities to make a game of it as the Colts knocked Kansas City back to their fifth straight defeat. When it was over, Baltimore had shown it just may be the coming monster of the NFL. It has not been a joyful season for the taped and hurting but courageous Jim Hart and the St. Louis Cardinals who'd lost three of their first four games. Even coach Don Coriel's bright smile seemed somewhat tempered in Philadelphia last week. In the first quarter, the Philly defense was more destructive and powerful than a speeding locomotive. But the Cardinal offense has two states of being, about to explode and exploding. Hard to number 84, Ike Harris gave St. Louis the lead for good. Then number 21, Terry Metcalf, added some comforting insurance on a 10-yard easy glider. The Eagles trailed 21 to three with five and a half minutes left in the game when number seven, Ron Jaworski, cranked up a face-saving rally. Pass to number 32, Herb Lusk made the score 21 to 10. But even the praying halfback couldn't intercede with a relentless sweeping of the second hand. A last ditch pass from Jaworski to number 17, Harold Carmichael, made the final score 21 to 17. But the Eagles rally was a quarter late and a touchdown short. <music> Meanwhile, in the Meadowlands, the Giants were not up against a bunch of pasture patsies because the 49ers had come east to lay on some hurting. While their defense isn't bad, the Niners' offense is neither footloose nor fancy. The Giants rolled at 20 points, six of them on this Joe Pisarczyk pass to tight end Gary Shirk. The lead held despite a furious last quarter rally by Jim Plunkett and his sometimes leaden, sometimes golden throwing arm. Kenny Harrison's catch set up one touchdown and Plunkett on a beautifully faked play action pass nailed Gene Washington for the last score of the game. The 20 to 17 final left San Francisco at 0 and 5, one of only three winless teams in the NFL. But while the 49ers are winless, the Cowboys don't know what the word could possibly mean. Last week, they disposed of Washington's Billy Kilmer with eight sacks and a physical disability pension. With Kilmer out due to injury, number seven, Joe Theismann, took over. The fourth-year Notre Dame grad, who has seen little action behind the practically indestructible Kilmer, was up to the doomsday pressure on only a few occasions such as this tally in the alley to number 38, Clarence Harmon, a rare redskin rookie.
But the Dallas offense was the showstopper last week as Robert Newhouse bullied and battered for one score. Then Drew Pearson turned the Redskin war bonnets into feather dusters as he dusted off number 45, Gerard Williams, and blazed 59 yards to cap a 34-16 Dallas victory dance. Now the big question in the NFC seems to be what color shirts will the Cowboys be wearing in Super Bowl 12? Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota. For the second time in as many weeks, the Minnesota Vikings played host to a battle for first place in the NFC Central Division. The latest challengers, Walter Payton and the Chicago Bears. Walter Payton leads the NFL in rushing because he performs well regardless of the caliber of Chicago's opponent. Against the veteran Vikings, Payton eclipsed the 100-yard rushing mark for the fourth time this season, setting up two Chicago touchdowns in the process. Chicago's two scores came on short rollout passes. One to Bo Rather, and this one to tight end Greg Latta. How about that, Viking fans? But Viking fans had no reason to despair. For Chuck Foreman outgained Walter Payton, rolling up 150 yards and a touchdown, as the Vikings match Chicago point for point, sending the game into overtime and setting up a Fred Cox field goal attempt. But a funny thing happened on the way to Fred Cox's game-winning field goal. Older Paul Krause to number 83, Stu Voigt. A surprise six-pointer as Minnesota rallied for a 22-16 overtime win. Why on earth conservative old Bud Grant ordered a fake field goal as anybody's guess? Whatever his reasons, the Bears sure weren't expecting it. For the Chicago Bears, it was a real bummer. Speaking of bummers, down in the Astrodome, the Houston Oilers declared themselves number one in the AFC Central Division, then sent John Hadle out in place of the injured Dan Pastorini to prove it. Fortunately for Houston, Dan Pastorini's absence didn't stop Oilers special teams from weaving their own special brand of magic. Number 84 is Billy Johnson adding another chapter to a story that's becoming all too familiar to Houston Oiler opponents. Eighty-seven yards of pure broken field wizardry. Ain't nobody in football who does it as often or as well. Get around, boys, and learn the white shoes shuffle. Unfortunately for Houston, Johnson's magic couldn't make Dan Pastorini heal any faster. And John Hadle just didn't seem to be the answer. Clarence Scott carried it back 49 yards, wiping out Billy Johnson's splendid effort and giving Cleveland the lead. Sensing trouble, Bum Phillips sent out Dan Pastorini to stem the tide. But a late hit leveled Pastorini for the duration, while number 27, Tom Darden, added insult to injury. Re-entered John Hadle, this time disguised as a mild-mannered placement holder. But once in the open field, he powered goalward like a mild-mannered placement holder. Gentleman John earned high praise for his death-defying scramble. He really hadn't intended on running. However, his lumbering effort kept Houston in the game. 
Brian Seip and the Browns have grown up a bit this season. This is a dogged, persistent Cleveland Brown team. A team that's earned league-wide respect for its solid showing in the season's first four weeks. The lead changed hands often, but despite the absence of Greg Pruitt, the Browns didn't allow the strong Oiler defense to put them away. Late in period four, they drove 54 yards to the Oiler 13, consuming the clock as they went. Then needing a field goal to win, the Browns sent out Don Cockroft. They don't make kickers any more dependable. For the second time this season, Don Cockroft ended the game with a placement as Cleveland outlasted the Oilers 24 to 23. If Cockroft had missed, Cleveland would have fallen two games behind the division leading Oilers, but he didn't. Now that's the stuff winners are made of.